Hi, I'm Wes, the Explosion, and we're here again, back to the Rockman World series with four. While there's been a few different approaches, the basic idea is to take four bosses from one NES game for the first half, another four from the following title for the second, then to top things off with a new boss, dubbed a Mega Man Killer except for Quint, and a new Wily stage and machine, and four is the last title to do this. Five's gonna throw things for a loop, but still, that makes four pretty significant since it's the last chance for them to get the formula right. So does it, or are these just redundant fluff since the full NES titles are right there, and portable now no less? Let's give it one more look before we get invaded by the star droids. So, there's a Robo Expo, and everyone who's anyone is there. Dr. Wily does a flyover though, and sends out a radio wave that turns their robots into his robots, but Rock and Rush are immune due to their strong sense of justice. Anyway, the rest start causing havoc around the city, so Dr. Light sends out Rock as Mega Man to set things right. Sucks to be Dr. Cossack, I guess, since four of his robots make up the first set of bosses. One of them's Barrow Man, so I guess the city has a pyramid exhibit somewhere too. Anyway, it's another silly plot, Mega Man being protected by justice, even without Duo yammering on about it. There's not a lot here, which is a little odd since it does feel like more effort was put into this one's plot. There's a few cutscenes where Mega Man faces down Wily's weapon platform, or the Iron Golem, but hey, that could be seen as more of a commitment to the visuals than storytelling. Though they do do some extra stuff when it comes to the Mega Man Killer 003, Ballad. He has two forms that you fight at different junctures in the game, and for I think the first time in any of these, he gets some actual dialogue. Spoilers, I guess. End of the game, you get a cutscene where Mega Man tries to escape Wily's space battleship Yamato, but can't quite blast through the outer wall. Ballad pops in, heavily damaged, and after a short exchange, blows himself up over Rock's protest to let him get flushed out into space before the ship explodes. And this feels weird, since it seems intended to not only deepen the story, but also make you like and feel sympathy for Ballad. But with no other conversations or build up, it doesn't quite land. Makes me wonder if this is another NES 3 situation where there was intended to be more there, but they either didn't have the time or memory space to program in the epic that they wanted. A shame Ballad never got more than a brief appearance in the Archie comics. You get to run, jump, and slide in this one, and while the Buster's back, it's a little different this time. You get the Super Mega Buster, which can still fire and charge, but charge shots now have kickback. This has an interesting element to the formula, since you need good positioning to use it, otherwise releasing a charge shot could cause you to get knocked into a hazard like, say, a pit. While this didn't get me killed too many times, it did happen a few and it still caused me a bit of anxiety. You get Rush Coil from Toad Man in the first half, and it works like it normally does, and Rush Jet from Charge Man in the second, and it once again does that stupid thing where it just flies straight, no tilting up or down. I still hate it, but hey. Rush feels pretty underutilized in this game, so it doesn't matter too much. They solved the problem with another problem. <sighs> double negative. You can also collect letters in each stage. The first set reassembles B. You can summon him to dive bomb enemies. The letters are in plain sight, but they sometimes require some pretty fancy or well-timed jumps to get. Or maybe I'm just making this one harder than it needs to be. There's another set of letters in the second half that spell Wily that you need to get to open the gate to the second ballad stage. These are all in plain sight as well though it's still easy to miss the one in Crystal Man's stage with how it's laid out and need to make a return trip. The big addition here, though, is Dr. Light's Lab, where you can convert P-Chips into power-ups. You can find these either as enemy drops, along with the rest of the usual stuff, and sitting around some of the stages. You trade them in for stuff like extra lives, E-Tanks and W-Tanks, which you can have up to four of, S-Tanks, which you can only have one of and will refill everything, and Ammo Refills, since they don't replenish in between stages, though I think this only starts in the second set of levels. You can also get partial E-Tanks, collecting four pieces to assemble a whole. You can also buy... The Energy Balancer, which will refill the lowest ammo weapon you have when you collect a power-up if what you currently have up doesn't need any. So yeah, World 4 adds in a store, the Energy Balancer, and S-Tanks as well, I believe, which became commonplace, if not staples, afterwards. Way to go, spin-off! Oh, and Eddie shows up once or twice to give you a random power-up. As for the weapons, they're mostly recycled and they mostly work the same. Rain Flush hits the whole screen and can also put out fires temporarily in Napalm Man's stage. 
Flash Stopper stops enemies in their tracks for a short period while also allowing you to plank them with your buster. Barrow Shot can be charged and thrown out at different angles, and you can also run into enemies with the charged energy over your head. Ring Boomerangs get sent out, then come back, and it can also bring power-ups with it. Charge Kick is just a slide with attitude, while Crystal Eye can either hit directly or split into three smaller ricochet shots if it hits a wall. Napalm Bomb fumbles around a bit before exploding, and it still sucks. Power Stone sends three boulders spinning out around you and might actually be good now since it's easy to hit with the smaller screen, but I still refuse to use it. Finally, you get the Mega Man Killer weapon, Ballad Cracker. This thing can be thrown in multiple directions, explodes on contact with a decent blast radius, and has good ammo consumption, so it's really darn good. Maybe the best in the killer line. And unlike the other ones that you get so late game that you might not use it for anything other than the one phase of the final boss, you will use Ballad Cracker, you little turd. You do not get a choice. Queue up a buster only run of the game, though I would question how they do the one section. For game progression, you get four stages to start with, an intermission, another four choose your order, then end game. The first set are for Toad, Wright, Barrow, and Ringman, and these are pretty similar to their NES counterparts. Toadman still has rain, running water, snail sub bosses, and the typical enemies. Bright still has the enemies that turn the lights on and off, as well as the half-circle platforms, but instead of some of the oddball stuff like the grasshoppers and totem poles, you now get these light-up platforms. Pharaoh still has sand, mummies, and scorpions, but now have some falling block platforms. Ringman still has the disappearing rainbow and link floors, with the usual Saturn and turret enemies, with the ring sub-bosses. So yeah, a few small tweaks, but if you played the NES, you should be fairly familiar with them. Then you get the intermission stage with a boss, a short section with bombs that serve as both platforms and walls, then you face Ballad for the first time. For the second half, you get Charge, Crystal, Napalm, and Stone. Each of these have at least one side path or secret room, giving them an exploration angle. Charge is pretty straightforward, you're just moving over and through a train with the standard rooster, mouse, and bomber enemies. Crystal probably has the most complex layout there being a branch in the way forward at one point, rather than just an optional side path. That makes this one feel a little bigger and more confusing, but it still has the Crystal Joes and Falling Crystals, though that second one now drops at a consistent rate and feels less random. There's also some sections where parts of the ceiling and floor rise, fall, or close shut, so you need to match your pace or even outrun the traps. Stone Man has his typical elements, but also these L-pipe platforms and stone ones that drop, like in Pharaoh Man's. I think some of these were on the NES, but it's starting to blend together for me. Stone Man's also got the Hippo Subboss that was previously Ring Man's, only now it's got a lot more blocks to sit on. Rather than knock them down, I just hit it with 8 Rain Flushes. Anyway, Napalm Man's probably has the biggest change up. You have footholds that explode and those drill walls show back up, which are still insta-kills, but rather than just blasting through them to get rid of them, there's a lot of parts where you want to hitch a ride or jump off of them. How much you enjoy each stage will likely depend on how much you like their previous iterations. I enjoy the recycled stuff enough, though Crystal Man's kinda stresses me out. Stone Man's tires me out, and I actually really like Napalm Man's, since while you need to be pretty careful with your movements, since most mistakes will kill you, they're not too terribly hard to pull off and it's really thrilling when you do. Still has a few cheap missile placements though. But hey, we're not done yet, there's still endgame. You get another short stage, with a few plates that draw you in, and power-ups to collect, before fighting Ballad again. After that, you need to get through a really nasty stage, the level collapsing behind you while you have to carve out a path to escape through the bomb platforms. This might be the hardest part of the game. You need to learn how to use your newly acquired Ballad Cracker in a trial by fire, which is kind of a clever and fun idea, but in practice, it really drives me crazy, and I think this stage was the main reason why I previously said this game made me cry. After that, it's on to Wily. You start out running down the bridge of Wily's ship while dealing with enemies and sub-bosses. This can be rough the first time, since you don't always have enough time to dodge incoming attacks with a smaller screen, but once you get through it once, it becomes easier to intuit, or at least remember, where they're coming from. At the end, you fight a boss, then you go into a longer stretch of stage, with lots of enemies, hits, and spikes. It's broken up by two bosses, and finally, at the end, you get a proper 8-man boss rush, lacking from the other games. 
then a refill hallway, then the final boss. The last stage is a real test of endurance, which brings up another thing with the special boss levels. I have a hard time knowing when one ends and another begins. While it's pretty normal for you to go from stage to stage for Wily, there's typically a screen in between, laying out the path you're taking, but here, they just kind of flow right into each other. It makes game overs even more scary when you don't know exactly how far you'll be sent back if you fail. I want to say that as long as you don't go out to the stage select, you'll be saved between the major transitions, but the last stage is still really long, and while I don't hate it, everything stuffed in is just more bang for your buck, I do kind of wish they had split things up like a more traditional Wily Fortress. The first four returning bosses are Toad, Bright, Pharaoh, and Ringman, and the second are Charge, Crystal, Napalm, and Stone Man. Like the previous Game Boy titles, they're largely the same, just in a smaller room with a few tweaked weaknesses. Some seem easier to take down, like Charge Man's movements feel a bit more predictable, and Napalm and Ring seem to die a bit quicker. Others, though, are a bit more annoying. It seems a little harder to get around Stone Man's invulnerability, and he stays on you a lot more fiercely while jumping around. Toad Man now hops about in between getting hit, though, rather than just letting you pretty much lock him in place, which is neat. Most, though, as long as you're using a weakness, you can stomp. Heck, they tend to not be too bad even without, given how strong the buster is, at least if you're using a full charge. As for the special bosses, there's a good number this time. For intermission, you battle a satellite dish that fires its little bulb at you, as well as projecting swirling energy when it opens up. It's mostly just dodging and waiting for an attack window. After that, you get First Form Ballad, who runs and jumps around while firing shots at you. Knock him down to 1 HP and he'll retreat. Fight him again after the next set of bosses and he'll transform, still running and jumping around but also dropping bombs that explode after a while with a large blast radius. While he appears as his first form in Mega Man 10, this is the attack pattern he uses there. In both fights, his size can make him a little hard to jump over, but as long as you dodge at least a little, it's not too hard to outdamage him. I'd say he's definitely the most manageable of the Mega Man killers. Because like I said before, Quint doesn't count. In the final stage, there's a whole heckin' lot. If you're here for the fights, you'll probably enjoy this one. The first section has this deck-mounted cannon, which will alternate between trying to hit you with one of the game's special weapons and grabbing you with its arm. When it attacks, its weak point opens up, so you need to strike while dodging. Then there's a pair of eye bosses. The first sends out a set of false balls at you, but I don't think it sends out more until you clear them all, so blowing up all but one and then just hammering the real one is the best strategy. You fight a pair of them later, each sliding over the floor and walls until meeting up again, and you want to hit whichever one's open. The different floor elevations can make this a little tricky, but it's not too bad. Then there's the boss rush, which we already covered those eight, and finally you get the Iron Golem. The big, obvious glowing weak point that occasionally fires at you is what you want to hit, though you can't exactly reach it. Instead, you need to wait for its other two attacks, where it either tries to punch you with its fist, or bring a hand crashing down, causing debris to fall as well. You need to hop on the fist, then jump again to shoot the weak point. The weak point moves towards the hand that's coming out, but you don't really have time to react even with this tell. So you kinda wanna anticipate attacks and already be jumping a lot of the time, and even if you do get on, you need to watch out for the stuff falling from the ceiling since the stun from getting hit will also make it so that you can't counterattack. After that, you fight the head. It'll try to suck you in and you damage it by striking the open mouth. Then it'll shoot attacks from its antennae that you just move back and forth to avoid. Finally, it'll try to rush you, and shooting it to push it back will prevent it from completely taking over your side. This one's pretty easy, so just rinse and repeat until you win. Then you get a Wily capsule. It'll disappear and then pop back in to drop a bomb that gets rid of parts of the floor. It's really easy to get a cheap death here, so you need to be paying attention. It takes a while for him to reappear, so be careful not to over-anticipate. After doing this twice, he moves to the right, dropping a few balls that block shots until he resets the screen, then starts the process over again. This transition is the best time to hit him, and while Pharaoh Shot is listed as the weakness, I'd suggest Ballad Cracker instead. It's easier to just huck a bunch of these straight up, rather than charge and try to angle your shots. On the whole, I'd mostly say that I like the bosses in the game, 
even if there are a few sore spots, especially with the finale which I feel has a cooler concept than Battle. Still, he's better executed than Gamma, so at least that's a plus. The visuals are the same as usual, green, gray, or in color, depending on what hardware you're using or filter you choose on NSO. And I still think the games look really good for Game Boy, most things translating really well and faithfully from the TV titles. And once again, if you play with Game Boy Color, the different layers are typically displayed as different colors, not always ones that fit, but still make it easy to tell what's you, an enemy, background, or foreground, which is fantastic. Nothing too different from what I said last time, but I will comment on the cutscenes that they sometimes throw in, for stuff like the opening and Mega Man reaching the next phase of Wily's plan. These look really cool, and while I doubt anyone's going to be too impressed these days, I think these would have really knocked my socks off back in the day. Heck, if you have an appreciation for what they were working with, it might still be enough to make you raise an eyebrow. It really shows that they tried to go the extra mile for this one. The music is largely pulled from Mega Man 4 and 5 on the NES, as you'd probably expect. The tracks were good there, so they're still good here, but I will say that unlike the last game, where I thought they sounded really close, here, I can definitely tell that they're on weaker hardware. As a sucker for old video game music, I still enjoy them quite a bit, there's just a more noticeable drop in quality, and can sound a bit bleary at points. Hopefully that doesn't disappoint people too much. As for original stuff, there's more of it here than normal, at least outside of 2, and they actually fit in pretty well. The opening theme sounds like it belongs as a Mega Man opening theme. Ballads works really well as a boss battle, and Wily Station does a good job getting you ready to beat some ass. Like I've already said a few times, you definitely get the feeling that they put a lot more effort into this one compared to the previous Game Boy entries. Other than that, the sound effects are still good, except for the Buster Charge, which is still grating. Maybe between that and the recoil, they were trying to encourage you not to overuse it. The difficulty is kind of split. The first half of the game has stages that feel just right for a Mega Man classic title. The length and difficulty are on par with what I'd expect a handheld adaptation of one of those games to be, and I'd say the same for Charge Man stage as well. The other three regular stages though feel a little complex, with the branching paths and some of the stage elements they throw your way, with the letters you need to collect adding to this. While not too hard to find, some do require some fancy movements and the ones for Wily are mandatory, meaning you really need to find that hidden nook in Crystal Man stage if you want to win. On top of that, there's the Ballad Cracker stage, which is one of the most stressful Mega Man levels I've ever played. With you needing to consider time, ammo, and blast radius, I found myself really abusing save states on my first run, and while I will admit that I've gotten through it pretty consistently since, I still really dread that part of the game and can see it leading to a lot of thrown controllers or systems for others. The final stage, while longer than most in the classic series, is probably on par for the rest of the Game Boy titles. There's also some of the other things I've complained about in the past. The small screen not giving you enough warning on some incoming attacks, slowdown being a major issue at some points, and some tricks that feel just plain malicious, but there's less of this than normal. Add into that the store, where you can buy tanks and the like, with cash to spend coming at a reasonable clip to help you through any bits that you're struggling with, and... I'd say this game is still harder than most of the NES titles, but on the whole, this one feels the most reasonable and, you know, good to get through of the Game Boy entries, though the nastier bits will still really stand out. Screw that escape sequence. So how do I feel about Mega Man 4? It still has a lot of the problems that the previous Game Boy entries did, smaller screen, hardware limitations, being largely recycled material, and having some cheap deaths sprinkled in, with one or two truly frustrating levels, so my first attempt, I absolutely hated it. Giving it another try though, figuring out how it works and mentally preparing myself for the nastier parts, maybe even learning to avoid them, I actually quite like it now. Despite the flaws, it still does a lot of things right and they do more original stuff in this one than the others, including a few things that I didn't immediately realize had originated here rather than mainline, so I do think it's a worthwhile game. Maybe not for everybody. More casual fans of the series might want to just stick to home console stuff, and others might just not want to bother due to the flaws I mentioned. But hey, if you do really like the classic series and haven't played this one yet, I would recommend it. I think you'll have fun. Maybe the second or third time. Save states might not be a bad idea. At the very least, I'd say it's the best of the Game Boy titles, 
so far. Ho ho ho, we're almost there. But hey, what about you? Have you played this one and what did you think? Is it a massive improvement or does it still have too much malarkey, like the other Game Boy games? And who's your favorite Mega Man killer? That'll do it for this week, so thanks as always for watching and maybe consider subscribing if you're into Mega Man, especially platformers. Crap, got that backwards.